Nukanatitu, Walarote, Ozori, Vigartes, Sirnan, one to Kanojene, Bicho, and Nanzo. Miss Masi, what in Nogan? Come by you, one Kusa and Gain, Kusa and the Nam, so he is twenty four. Why am I here? Six weekends of major artists. The Panthers were the security and kids were sitting up on the trees. I was nervous. I didn't expect a crowd like that. Something very important was happening. Har du nogensinde fortalt din livshistorie før? Nej. Vi skal ud. Det er nu. Tsunami to Ninja Boshi. Det er dårligt som medier, at min bror han bliver tilbage. Vi flygtede med menneskesmuglen. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Caesar, and I am the chief operating officer of No Studios. And I am so thrilled and pleased to welcome you to the second segment of the No Studios critical content series, which features conversations with some of the most impactful filmmakers from 2021. And uh, it's a special night because I am joined by Kara Ogburn, the artistic director of Milwaukee Film. And Milwaukee Film is one of the critical concert, uh, critical content sponsors. Kara, how are you? Thank you so much for joining. Good. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, you know, I think you know, in looking at the lineup, you know, no studios in Milwaukee film share some alignment in our missions, really trying to connect filmmakers and films to their audiences, and also sort of starting those vital conversations that really matter for our community here in Milwaukee and around the world. Um, and I'm so excited, was so excited to see the film lineup because all three of the sort of feature films that are being featured are films I saw at Sundance like just about a year ago now. And as I gear up to attend Sundance again, from my couch. Uh, I'm really excited <laughs> to see what the next wave of those films and conversations will be. You know, these these three features all really open up a world, um, whether it's, you know, sort of a local world, world that's you know just just in Harlem with our, our closing night film, Summer of Soul, which you'll be seeing a conversation tomorrow around, or tonight's film, Svaya Dai, or uh, this first film, Flea, uh, kind of brings us into that kind of other space in a really important way. And I'm so excited that you have the opportunity to really dig in with those filmmakers. I did wanna note for our Milwaukee based audiences that Milwaukee Film will be opening Flea at the Oriental Theater, uh, not this coming Friday, but the Friday following the 28th of January. Tickets will be available soon. You can just go to our website, mkefilm.org or walk on up to the box office. Uh, this is one you won't want to miss seeing on a big screen. It's really one of the most beautiful films of the the year, last year, this year. It's 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 a really wonderful film and I'm really excited to be able to bring it to Milwaukee. Um, but thanks Lisa so much for giving us the opportunity to help kind of support. Now we're, we're super excited. So tonight, um, as Kara alluded to, it's a special night because we're offering two conversations with John Ridley. The first is with the director of Flea, uh, Jonas Rasmussen. And the second, uh, beginning at 7 p.m. Central Time, is a conversation with uh, Jessica Bashir uh, from Faya Dei. So um, don't want to take up too much time because I know you all are interested in, in hearing these important conversations. Uh, one housekeeping note is that if you're watching the conversations from our website viewing page, um, we've included closed captioning uh, for these conversations. You may need to refresh your screen, um, but then you can hit the CC indication in the bottom in the corner of the display and you should be able to access the closed captioning. And then also, you know, before Kara and I uh, leave you to the discussions, I just want to acknowledge and mention our sponsors, which include WISN 12 News, Generator, Women's Voices Now, Creative Cipher, and of course, Milwaukee Film. So thank you so much for supporting and, and joining these uh, fantastic conversations, and um, we'll leave you to it.
Prøv en lille smule længere op. Bare lidt. Så hvis du ligesom lukker øjnene nu? Ja. Og prøver at trække vejret sådan dybt ind. Hvad betyder ordet hjem for dig? Hjem er noget, som er trygt. Kabul, les attaques des Mujahideen, repris. Har du nogensinde fortalt din livshistorie før? Nej. Vi skal ud. Det er nu. Tunami to ninja boshi. Vildt dårligt som mediet er, at min bror han bliver tilbage. Vi flygtede med menneskesmuglerne. Vajekale! Det værste mennesker i mit liv. Har du fortalt Kasper nogle af de her historier overhovedet? Nej. Det tager tid at stå det på folk. Det går rundt. Og tænk tilbage. Så det er min fortid, og det er jeg. Jeg ikke flygtet fra det, og jeg har ikke lyst. Jeg kan mærke, at der skal ske noget. Her starter jo min historie. Hi, I'm John Ridley, and welcome to Critical Content, a celebration of some of the year's most impactful documentary storytelling. Critical Content is produced by No Studios in association with The Wrap and in partnership with WISN Television in Milwaukee, Milwaukee Film, and Creative Cipher. The documentary feature, Flea, was named the 2001 Grand Jury Prize winner at the Sundance Film Festival in the World Cinema Documentary category. And if I were to list all the other awards or nominations that the film has received, I'd probably be sitting here for a good two minutes. So let's just say it's one of the most recognized films, not just documentaries, films of the last year. And one critic said that it was an intimate portrait of the lasting traumas of displacement and one of the most humane films of the year. Um, not to overgrandize, but yeah, with respect to the writer, that's a bit of an understatement. I'm very pleased to be joined by the director of the film, uh, Jonas Rasmussen. Jonas, welcome to the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. And congratulations on the film. It is incredibly powerful. It's incredibly humane. When we get together with critical content, we go through the films that we want to talk about over the year. I was not aware of Flea. Uh, someone pitched it to me and they said, it, it's, you know, in short, it's a film about immigration. Um, but the film is about so much more than just that. And there's some things, even in this conversation, I'd love to keep just a little bit arcane because I really believe people need to see this film and they need to feel it unfold. But I will say this, you know, this is a documentary, but it, the central subject of the film, uh, a man named Amin, who is an immigrant from Afghanistan was not just a subject that you'd pick, but if I understand correctly, this man was, was a friend of yours and his story was one that you knew for many years. Talk about your relationship to a man and the subject matter and the process of deciding that this was a story that you wanted to tell. Well, I, um, I met Amin when I was 15. Um, I grew up in this very small Danish rural village. Um, and when I was 15, uh, Amin arrived all by himself. Uh, he was 16 and he stayed in foster care with a family just around the corner from where I lived. And um, he learned Danish incredibly fast. And we started meeting up at the bus stop every morning, going to high school, and we became very good friends. Um, and this is, this is 25 years ago now. Uh, and of course, already back then, I was already um curious about how and why he got to my village um but he didn't want to talk about it um hmm. and I've, i have of course respected that uh, but our friendship kind of went on and, and grew and we've been traveling together and we you know we've had heartbreaks together uh, we've uh, experienced a lot of things together um but always he had this you know 
black hole, uh, this hidden story that he he didn't want to talk about. And then I have a background in, in radio documentary. And uh, I think about 15 years ago, I, I asked him if I could do a radio documentary about his story. Um, and he then told me that that he knew that he would have to share his story at some point, um, but he didn't feel quite ready yet. Um, but when he would, would be ready, he would like to share it with me. So I had it in the back of my head for, for a long time that this was something we could do together at some point. Um, I just had to wait till he felt uh, ready to do it. Um, and then again, years passed, and I was invited for this uh, workshop here in Denmark called Anidox, where they uh, find uh, animators and documentary filmmakers and get them together to kind of develop ideas for animated documentaries. And, and they asked me if I had an idea and I thought, okay, but maybe animation is the way to, to tell the story. And I then met up with him in again and, and asked him if he would uh, be willing to share his story with me and we would then make it into an animated feature. Um, and he finally said, yes, he said that he felt ready to share his story. And he was really intrigued by the fact that he could be you know, anonymous behind the animation, um, because what you hear in the film is the very first time he talks about it. You hear his real voice talking about uh, his innermost secrets, his traumas for the very first time. And um, it's not easy for him to talk about. So the fact that he could be anonymous and not be mm -hmm. in the public eye with these stories was really important to him, that he could kind of keep control over when he want, wanted to talk about the, the story. Yeah, the, the film is, I'll say loosely, it's an animated film. And that was one of the things that when it was first pitched was very intriguing. And I do want to talk about the style in a moment because although it's an animated film, and I'll, I'll bring this up later, to me it's almost a multimedia experience, uh, which is part of, to me, the genius of not just having the story, but how you tell the story. But one of the things for you, and you mentioned in a, a previous interview, that for you this was always a story about my friend that it wasn't just a documentary, but you were really trying to help a friend tell a story. And that, and you mentioned it was multi years in, in making sure that he was comfortable, that he was ready to tell the story. But even as you began, and again, if I understand this timeline correctly, and I think it's important for people to understand how much time that this took for everyone to be ready, emotionally ready in a place, and that there was a year and a half, once you began, I believe recording some of these interviews, about a year and a half before you knew that this that this journey would lead to anything. What was it like in that time period, beginning something, but knowing, as you say, you were telling the story of a friend and that it may not come to any more fruition than other than deepening your friendship. Certainly nothing wrong with that. You know, when you make documentaries and you have a subject and the story is, is uh, sensitive, like, like you need to take the time to make sure that you do it right. Um, and with this story, it was really about, about creating a, a space for him where he felt safe um that he felt that this was the right way to to share his story so so we spent as you said a, a year and a half in the beginning um where we just kind of tried it out and and he tried to tell me little things and then you know he could go home and he could think about okay does this feel right is it okay for me to kind of start sharing and then he would slowly you know share more and more um and 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 it was just really crucial that he felt that that this felt right um uh, just before we started you know the, the the very complex process of making an, an animated film it was crucial that that he felt that this was the way to do it with documentaries there are times where a documentarian has the the uh, the pleasure of being objective and slightly removed from their subject that that's one of the things about being a documentarian in some spaces you can be removed you can be a step away this was your friend this was someone that you were very close to from everything you're saying it wasn't just about you making a film but allowing someone to tell their story and i will also say for those watching stories uh, again there's so much going on in this film for you was it ever difficult making this film because i mean was your friend because you wanted to honor that friendship and honor his story, but at the same time, you know, you, you didn't have that slight remove as a documentarian. You were a friend trying to help a friend tell his stories. Yeah, but that's definitely, you know, there was a lot at stake in this process of making this film, uh, and that made it more difficult. But, but to me, at least, often when it's difficult, it, it's really when it becomes interesting, you know, when there's obstacles and you really need to, to use your... Um, uh, like 
you, you use your creativity to find to figure out okay how do we uh, how how do we conquer these obstacles um and 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 so to me like making films isn't easy like it, it's really you know it takes time it's a lot of work and it's difficult hmm. but that's also what makes it profound and interesting to work with yeah profound and interesting is is a great phraseology as was mentioned uh i read a a, a quote from another critic i've said it myself this is an amazingly humane film it is multiple stories it is not just about immigration it's about a young man coming from afghanistan that harrowing journey several other journeys but also a journey of self um identity perspective there was something that you said in an interview and i mean this almost not almost i mean this very sincerely and this is a phrase that i think should be stamped on a marker on almost every border in every nation around the world you said being a refugee is not an identity it's a circumstance this is not a choice this is an imposition um it's simple and yet it's powerful for you was this something that you arrived to and i don't want to assume that you arrived to it you may have been someone uh, among many people who was just born with an incredibly humane heart but do you feel that perspective was maybe something that you arrived to in knowing i mean over these years or at the end of telling the story that there were things that again being born with a beautiful heart um we can all learn we can all understand more for you did you find yourself going on an even more immense journey just through the process of telling the story yes definitely you know in the beginning um, the genesis of the story is really my curiosity about my friend's story it really comes from the friendship and and i was i, I didn't think that i wanted to do a refugee story and then went out and found a refugee it, it was really about me having a friend who had this hidden secret or had this hidden past for so many years. Um, and I was fundamentally just curious about that. And then when we started making the film, I learned a lot and there was different steps in that. You know, in, in, in the beginning, uh, we started doing the film in 2013. And then um, a couple of years later, we had a big refugee crisis here in Europe. Um, or they call it a, a refugee crisis, but it's really a humanitarian crisis. Um, mm. But, but, and, and, and then, you know, it dawned on me, okay, but this is, yes, it's a story about my friend, but it's also a story about uh, what it means to be a refugee. Um, and, and I learned that, yes, Amin was a refugee, uh, but that's, that's not who he is. Uh, it, it was a circumstance that, that he lived through uh, for, for five years of his life, and it's marked him forever. But, you know, he's so many other things, and it's not what, uh, it is, yeah, it's not his identity. Um, and then, you know, I, I, it also dawned on me that, well, I'm, I'm not a refugee myself, but, but two generations back, my, my grandparents had to flee as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that this, you know, the story of displacement is something that can happen to everyone. It's not just from the Middle East or um, South America. It, it happens everywhere. And, and it, it's, it's something that could happen to, to you and me as well. Yeah, and again, your phraseology, I, I just think, I. If everyone was aware of that and everybody actually thought that, I think we could do more to solve, as you say, not a refugee crisis, but a humanitarian crisis. I think it's one thing to have an idea, to have a subject, even to have an amazing story and tell a documentary. That, that uh, folks do year in and year out, and I, I deeply appreciate that form of storytelling. Your form of storytelling, and, and this, we're jumping back a little bit, it, it is on the surface in animated film, but as I said, to me, this is so much more than just an animated film. And I want to get to some of the aspects of storytelling because it is really remarkable. But you, you mentioned something earlier, and, and forgive me, I think you've jumped past it a little bit. Um, I want to drill down on this. You, you were a radio documentary storyteller, but then you went to an animated documentary workshop, which to begin with, to me, is surprising. I didn't know there was such a thing. But just talk about that process because being an animated film, I want to be clear with people, this is not a cartoon. This is not something for kids. That's fine. I, I think young people can watch this film and be impacted. But there is a real style, sense, thought, and directorial approach to this film. I want to get into all that. But let's just start with what sounds like, you know, you went online. Hey, it sounds like here's an interesting workshop. It may be just more than that. But, but please talk about that and what in that process led you to believe that this is more than just the style of storytelling, but this may be an impactful delivery method for a story that you knew that you wanted to tell. 
Um, it was really when I, you know, when I started talking to the animators that I realized, okay, but there's more to this than just, you know, uh, making him uh, anonymous. Um, mm -hmm. But to go back a little bit, um, I have a background in radio documentary. I have also done uh, documentaries, film documentaries before uh, I did Flea. So, so it wasn't just out of the blue that I thought I wanted to do a, a, a film. Um, but then this workshop, uh, they gathered, you know, documentary filmmakers and animators, and we just sat down and and um, I kind of in, the, in that process realized, okay, but 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 here we can, you know, because a I mean story takes place mostly in the past, so it's really animation is a is a, a really vibrant way to make the past come back alive. We could really, you know. Uh, recreate his childhood home, recreate Afghanistan in the 80s and Moscow in the 90s, where it still feels like that, where it still feels like Afghanistan in the 80s. And we kind of incorporate, you know, archival footage from that period and, and, and take things directly from the archival footage and put it into the animation, you know, draw it. And so it felt like um, right. that this is a film that takes place in the real world, even though it's animated. But then also because it's, it's really a story about memory and trauma. And with the animation, it, it enables us to be somewhat more honest to, to, you know, his emotions, because at times when he started to talk about things that's really hard for him to talk about his traumas, um, I could kind of, you can sense it in his voice that he kind of slows down and he's, he, and he, it, it becomes a bit more incoherent what he, his words. Um, and I thought, okay, but we need to see this in the animation in, in a style of animation as well. So we came up with this kind of more expressive charcoal, black and white, uh, kind of animation. That was um, that we wanted to to really be more expressive and surreal about these things because when he starts talking about his traumas, it's not about what what things look like anymore. It's about his emotions. It's, it's about being afraid, being scared, being sad, hmm. um, and and that was a, a layer uh, would, like the animation could could bring in that we couldn't do with a with a camera. Well, it it is a very you know you talk about trauma, you talk about. Um, the challenges, the emotional challenges in telling the story. And for people who have not seen the film yet, you mentioned it, it's Afghanistan in the 1980s. So it deals with the Soviet invasion. It deals with the war. Um, once the Soviets pull out, uh, the rise of the Mujahideen, the Taliban, uh, the conscription of young men to become soldiers, the civil war, fighting, uh, death, violence fleeing the country, uh, arriving to Russia, a whole other story there and what it's like for the immigrant experience. Um, it, it is very tough storytelling. But one of the things that I appreciate it, again, it's not just animation. It really is multimedia storytelling. So there is animation. There is uh, found footage that is woven in. There is music. One of the things I appreciate it, I sat down and I really prepared myself for a difficult story. And one of the first things that happens is, you know, aha is playing. Uh, this young man is listening to music and, and you feel an experience. You arrive to these individuals as people, just as you were saying before you understand that it's about circumstance. Talk about a little bit, if you will, that multimedia approach, the sound design, the music, all of those choices that you made to help put us in a place that um, I think most of us can't even imagine. Yeah, but you know, it, it, it's, it's true. Like it, it is a mix of animation, found footage, music, um, and and first of all, you know, this testimony, this real voice that you hear throughout the film, and and basically everything kind of came out of that, you know, from the testimony, from his voice. When the, the music we hear in the film is really, you know, his own playlist, um, what he listened to on that walkman mm -hmm. back in Afghanistan, and you know, it was one of the first interviews I did with him, and we started talking, and he started talking about this walkman. And um, I was surprised that he, you know, listened to the same Norwegian and Swedish pop music that I listened to back home in Denmark. Um, and I thought, okay, but then probably other people will be surprised as well. And I, and I really liked the thought, okay, but let's not arrive to Afghanistan with, you know, a classical Afghani instrument, but 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 doing it with Aha, um, um, because that was what he listened to. Um, and I think, you know, because the story is told from the inside of a friendship, um, I, I get all these nuances, you know, because in our friendship, we also, we laugh a lot and we can talk freely about him ha having a crush on Chokram Van Damme, you know, and all these things <laughs> that gives a bit of humanity to the story. So you don't feel just the, the hardship and the harrowing uh, journey he goes through, but you also feel, uh, get all the little kind of touches of, of humanity and, and, and what's really nice in these kind of stories. And, and I also, uh, uh, 
like when I watch films, is is when you get to laugh with your with the subject or the protagonist of the film, uh, that it kind of cracks you open and and it creates a bond between you and the and the protagonist. And and when you have a bond, then you also you you know, it, it generates empathy. Um, so it was really important to have these touches of the friendship in there, so you kind of get these connections uh, throughout the film. Well, I certainly got those, and, and and you mentioned briefly. You know, I'm in there. There are many journeys that he's he's taking in this story, um, and one is is towards self discovery. And there are moments where there are characters. I wouldn't say characters. You know, real life people in Hollywood and Bollywood um, that you will see interacting with him in his mind, in his imagination. And there is a slyness to that. There is a almost a literal, well, a literal wink in some ways that I deeply appreciated because just as a person, I could relate to that. I could relate to hopes and dreams and an element of self-discovery. And again, that's one thing that I really appreciate about this film. It hits very hard. It's emotionally impactful, but you never lose. Even as you say in something where you're trying to be anonymous in one fashion and help protect the identity of this person, there is so much about identity that comes through, and I appreciate the slyness that goes into that directorial style. And I do want to talk about that for a second because I felt the film was incredibly well directed. There are, as you say, shifts in the kinds of animation. There's the use of music. Um, there's just little things. You know, you can see even in the animation a bit of a handheld style in some places that gave it a certain life and a feeling. Um, you went through a documentary workshop, but uh, if I understand correctly, this would be the first. I'll call it an animated film that you directed. Can you talk about the process for you about the real direction of this film beyond excavating the story? And what was that like? Things that maybe you discovered and even perhaps difficulties in arriving to something that feels so incredibly well formed in its iteration. Yeah, but it, it was really, uh, you know, a journey with the with my with the partners I found, you know, with the animation studio, Sun Creature Studios, uh, and I had an animation director, Kenneth, and my art director, just just Nichols, and we just sat together for a long, long time and just found, you know, references uh, for from other films and but also from visual arts uh, and, and just tried to find uh, a, a, a style of animation that would support what you hear. In the testimony, and again, you know, the, te the testimony is really core cool for everything in the film. And first, we did a test, uh, an animation test, where it became a little toony. You know, he had big eyes, like you see in, in Pixar films, and and everything became very smooth, and and it, it worked quite well. But it also became a little detached from the testimony. So we kind of had to go back, you know, and really find a style of animation that 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 supported the the authenticity that is in the voice, in the fact that you have a real voice behind the animation. Um, so it was a long, it was a very steep learning curve for me for, because I hadn't, I hadn't tried doing animation before. So I really learning how to, what the process was and, and, and learning the craft. I, I didn't animate anything myself, but, but just learning the process of making an uh, animated feature was, 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 um, a quite remarkable experience. And also, especially, you know, this thing that in animation, you kind of edit before you shoot. Which for someone yeah. normally working in documentary or in live action films, it sounds crazy. But but because you do you, you you because animation is so expensive, you have to you can't animate forty hours of material and then edit it down. So first you edit in these very rough storyboards, um, which gives a, an, a, a remarkable uh, amount of freedom in the process of of really making sure that the that the sequences works as uh, you could be really precise in, in, in your storytelling, uh, which was uh, a really amazing experience. Well, it's an amazing experience to uh, enjoy, maybe the wrong word, but to, to certainly uh, have wash over you. And the flourishes, you know, you, you talk about the things that you, you, you pulled out of the story in terms of being in service of the story. There are moments, for example, when Amin is on, on the phone with his brother. And you can hear that sort of heavy telephonic breathing that really puts you in that space. There are moments, as you say, where his voice slows down and you can hear that emotion that is incredibly powerful. One of the things that I did appreciate, we talked about it being a bit of a multimedia film, but there are moments where you go to real footage. You see the war in Afghanistan and, and one is reminded that this is real. This is more than just an animated story. And unfortunately, this is one story. This is one story among so many stories of individuals who had to flee their circumstances. And I deeply appreciate that element of the story of just, um, you're in it, you're in it for a moment, 
uh, just as a story unfolding, and then you're reminded in the most harshest terms that found footage, bodies laying in the street, just how real and how powerful all of this is. So congratulations on, on, on that element of it. Um, there's, in and among, as I talk about this story being so powerful, I have, I have a, a, one last question for you, and it's a, it's a bit of a personal question. Well, just in terms of your personal perspective. Um, there's a, a saying that goes, you know, history repeats itself. And there's a belief that I have that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And I think sometimes we make a mistake when we try to give a one-to-one, -one, oh, well, this was that, um, and comparing tragedies and, and things like that. But there's certainly elements of history that repeat themselves. As this film was making its, its journey into the world, um, we're seeing a, a, a rhythmic repeat of what's going on with Afghanistan. And I don't want to get into the politics of the war, but certainly I think we could have done a better job in terms of being there for people who were there for us in our mission. For you as someone who has been aware of a, a story among Afghanistan refugees and just refugees in general, but seeing history rhyme, what was it like for you watching this again? What were your feelings? And did you feel a sense of urgency then with this film? and getting people to hopefully understand, as you say, that being a refugee is not, a, not, a, uh, not a, uh, something that is a choice, but something that is imposed upon people. You know, first of all, it, it was just heartbreaking and surreal to see. You know, it, it felt like it was exactly the same shots that I've been working on in this film, when, you know, when I mean, is fleeing Kabul, and then to see almost the exact same shots in the news was just surreal and, and heartbreaking and even more so for I mean you know who's 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 very tied still with Afghanistan and has family members there and and she just and it, it just reminded him that now a, a big group of an, an entire generation of, of Afghans are now going to be in the same situation he was in for years and be in a limbo somewhere um but um you know it's just um there's there's an urgency to it you know it, it, it became sadly relevant and i really wish it wouldn't be as relevant as it is um but 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 to me you know it's, it's just important to, to to show the humane story uh to it and i think i don't know about in the states but i think most of the world the refugee story is told quite black and white so just to give some nuance mm -hmm. to it and 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 show the Main part to it and, and not going to politics, not trying to do the discussion in, in politics, but just kind of look at a person's journey and, and, and see what it does to a human being to uh, lose your home um, was really important to me, is really important to me. Okay. Well, this, uh, you say that, and, and it is a humane film. This is a humane story. It really is a story about a journey. And there are so many things that are going on with the men. There are so many things that are so beautiful. One of the things that I do appreciate in the storytelling is that um, you allow a normalization for an individual and seeing this individual just as a person. And there are some things that are so large and so impactful. But what I appreciate is you treat them as they're just normal because they are. They are absolutely normal. Um, this is a remarkable film. I will say again, this is a film that people need to experience because as tough as it is, it is beautiful. You will laugh, you will cry, um, and you will appreciate. You really will. Uh, the name of the film is Flea. It is currently in theaters for everybody who's watching in Milwaukee. I believe it's going to be in theaters January 28th, but we'll make sure that everyone is aware of it because I want people to see this film. Uh, Jonas, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for thank sharing you, this story. And thank you for your artistry. Um, all the best with this film. I don't know that it can be more honored, but I, I, with every honor that is out there, um, it's deserved, but what this film does is, is more than just collect war, awards. It really tells an impactful, beautiful, harrowing story. So congratulations to you. And frankly, I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you very much. We will be back with another session of Critical Content Stories That Matter produced by No Studios. Thank you. There's not a day that goes by that we don't lose friends, fellow filmmakers, and artisans from the film industry. In the last year, one life that was lost that we'd like to honor 
was that of Diane Weirman. Diane was a tireless advocate for documentary storytelling, and as chief content officer of participant media, she was instrumental in bringing such films to life as Collective, Citizen Four, and An Inconvenient Truth. And one title that Diane was still working on up until her death was this year's critically acclaimed documentary feature, Flea. Although Diane will be mourned in the present, her impact on documentaries, storytelling, and cinema will endure far into the future.